Hello, hello. It's Simone once again with Technical Writer HQ. Uh, we are the largest platform that connects technical writers globally. We've been featured in Forbes. We are a top community for tech entrepreneurs as well as product people. We also host several um, courses for technical writers and students looking to up their game when it comes to technical writing. Um, today, we are excited to welcome again <laughs> Bill Kelly. Um, last week, we apologized. We had some technical issues. Um, it happens. It happens. Um, but we have Bill Kelly with us today, and we're going to get right into it. We're going to ask him to introduce himself, where he works, and how long he has been a technical writer. Bill? Good morning. Um, my name is Bill Kelly. Uh, I am the senior technical writer for Sataki USA. We are a manufacturer of food sorting equipment, and we're based in Hiroshima, Japan, but Sataki USA is actually in Stafford, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. I've been a technical writer for 36 years. I know. 36 years. Wow. <laughs> wow. I actually used a computer. Uh, but uh, I've been with Sataki for almost 20 years. Nice, nice. So 36 years. Um, last last week, I only had a chance to sort of read your some things you had wrote back to us when we first reached out to you. Um, can you walk us through, you talked about actually physically copying and pasting text and images oh, yeah. into like paper documents. Can you walk us through that process because and where we are today? Well, it's, it is leaps and bounds different. I mean, I used to have, there was a staff of 10 of us. Nice. I mean, I was doing the actual writing. Uh, we had a photographer, and he would take the pictures, and I would actually do functional layouts. Uh, I would print on a dot matrix printer. All right, it's going to look like this. Great. And then we would use a laser printer to do the final copy, and it would be cut and paste onto each page. And uh, we would do it in columns because it's a lot easier to do it that way than to just go all the way across the page. Ooh, look at my fingers going back and forth. <laughs> that is, and then we had people had, we had people to collate it. We had, um, later we also hired a desktop publisher, which made some of the work a little bit easier. But there were, there were a grand total of 10 of us doing this. And I was doing, um, custom manuals. Every single job that my the first company did had their own personalized manual. Now, I changed it. I updated it to where we had a lot of stuff that was boilerplate. In other words, this is going to be in every single manual. Okay, we can do that. So that made it a lot easier. My predecessor, who hand wrote everything and handed it off to a typist. Wait, wait, wait. Your predecessor hand wrote <laughs> everything. Okay. He wrote absolutely wow. everything in pen. Uh, very neat, blocky handwriting, and he would hand it off to a secretary at the time. So one of the reasons I was hired was that uh, when I had submitted my resume to this company, I worked for them five years previously, and then went off into the Navy and then came back. Thank so you for like, the service. We remember Bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, we remember Bill. Okay, he knows how to use a computer. He's taking technical writing courses in college. Great. George, my predecessor, hand wrote absolutely everything. So that was that was a step in my favor, and that started my career. Wow! And, but then we started doing things to where the subsequent companies I worked for, I've laid off a couple of times. Uh, subsequent companies, we would lay things out in Microsoft Word, where we would we would take a picture. We would insert it in the Word document, but it looked like something that was created in Microsoft Word. And even when I started at Sataki in 2004, we worked in Word then, but my boss and I had decided that this really needs to look a lot more professional. And we started using uh, Madcap Flare as a content generator, but it also is a desktop publisher, and it does absolutely beautiful work. And so we're able to do page layouts. I do the photography as well. I do all the layouts. Our manuals are now generated in PDF. We can give you a, a hard copy if you'd like one. But it's just so much easier. I'm doing the work with 10 people from 36 years ago. And even then, I was doing the work of two people before me. 
the technical writer, handwriting, and the typist. Wow. Wow. And then when when you, back then, were you typing on a computer or was it a typewriter? Like what were you using to generate the, the copy? I used an IBM PC XT. In other words, a, a, a first generation PC. That is wild. That is wild. <laughs> that is wild. And then and then you fast forward it all the way to Madcap Flare and Microsoft Word. How was that adoption process in the company that you worked for? Were they open arms or was it scary like to find yeah. this technology? Yeah. Of my original company was open to it. We, when I started typing, it was in WordStar 2000. We used WordStar 2000 because one of the engineers had a copy. And back then, everything was pirated. Hey, you've got a copy? Hand me that disk. I'll put it in my machine and I'd slide in with four, five and a quarter inch disks. And now I had WordStar 2000. But then we went to um, Word Perfect. Mm. Um, Word four, five, six, and stopped at seven. Then the change went over to Microsoft Word. Word became the standard. Uh, Word Perfect really is only used by lawyers nowadays. Mm. I, I, their support, their, they have stronger support for eight and a half by 14 uh, pages, which uh, legal size, that's why they're called legal size. And then, but then now Word is the pretty much the standard for just document printing, but uh, we went to Flare and other people use Adobe. Uh, Madcap was actually started by people who used to work for Adobe. Mm. Um, it is, and, and like I said, I lay out professional looking work from my desk. And it, it, and it, and it even it surprised me. I remember when we had Rusty to do this and Vito to do that and Leanna would do this and it's me. That is wild. That is wild. Um, so, so looking at Madcap Flare and the tools, have you has the content creation itself gotten better with the tools, or yeah. has the like how, how do you feel the the actual content itself? The nice thing about Madcap Flare is that you can it's it's content. You turn things into like what they what they call snippets little bits and pieces of stuff or big bits and pieces of stuff it's all single stored single source and whatever i need i can pull down and drop into a document there was a time uh december of 2022 i was writing the manual for the brand new manual for our brand new product line at sataki the vantage sword big huge thing and what i had crashed and i thought oh no I said I was going to have this, I was going to present this at lunchtime for review. I went in, I recreated the document, pulled down everything that I need, dragged and dropped in, and within two hours, I went from basically just a jumble of stuff to a really nice professional looking manual. I clicked build, and there it is. And that was it. And I even told my boss about this. I said, hey, man, do you think, guess what just happened? Oh, no. Are we going to be able, oh, yeah, I've recreated a new one. Oh, thanks. I could not do that 20 years ago. I couldn't do that 15 years ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. How far we've gone. Just, just using single source and, and the way that it is content generation. It's not a word processor at all. And, does, and desktop publishing is just, it's amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. So let's think, take a go ahead. Madcap player there. Okay. Let's let's take a step back. You said you work at Sataki. Can you tell us more about that company and what you do there now? Yes. Well, Sataki USA is actually uh we are a the American subsidiary of the Sataki Group. Sataki Corporation is sorry, this is driving kind of crazy. I had something it's a cat hair. <laughs> Shukat. Um, okay, there you go. Um, Sataki was founded in Hiroshima back in, <coughs> sorry, it's spring, uh, back in 1896. And it was a, a, they started making rice milling machines. And then they started making sorting machines for rice, because rice is a big part of the Japanese diet. Um, and, but then they started uh, making milling machines and they realized 
that optical sorting was something that could help them. They wound up buying a company in, uh, in Houston called ESM that now became Sataki USA. We had built um, mechanical optical sorters and then started digital optical sorters, uh, you know, actually using, rather than just using a, a UV light to go, oh, that was bad. It's actually, we use uh, CCD cameras and, and uh, other cameras to look at the, uh, to look at each particle as it goes past. And it drops down a chute. And what happens is that uh, if the camera detects something bad, and the camera can look at 400 millimeters worth of product, and, and we have more than one camera at a time. So what happens is that um, it sees a bad one, and we have something called a little ejector. A tiny little puff of air blows the bad product into a defect chute. And all the good product keeps uh, sliding down into the accept chute to be used. This is why you can look at, I look at, because I've worked in the industry, say for example, when I get split peas, I will look through them because I know Satoshi sorts split peas. And I will look through the package just to see if there are any stones or anything in there. And usually there is nothing because we can sort and then we can resort. Uh, and, you know, we're, the sorting industry is huge now and we're a big part of it. That's incredible. I remember you also shared that you came from previously in the oil and gas industry with a focus on power before you came to Sotaki. So how, for the interview process for your, um, I know a lot of people are transitioning from different industries into technical writing. How did you leverage, what did you leverage to come from a very different industry, you know, heavy equipment, oil and gas, into like um, optical sorting and the food industry. How did you do that? Uh, a lot of research. Okay. <laughs> when, I, when I found out that I was contacted by a headhunter and they said, well, you know, we have a company here outside of Houston that is doing, uh, that needs a technical writer and they sort food. And I thought, sort food? What's going on there? So uh, basically I started, I, I you know, I searched on the web. First, I looked at their website, and then I looked at the industry. So I was, I had to be prepared for that. The slide just went up with, what do you do here? Well, this looks really cool. I never would have gotten a job. And um, it's, it was a lot of, it was a lot of research. I probably spent, because I was coming from a different industry, still, I mean, there is, the machines are electrically powered. So, right. And there, there, there are PLCs controlling this and this, that. Um, so I also, when I design the manual, I, I will say, do this, do this, do this, do this, because I read the schematic. Uh, because I came from power systems, I knew how to read the schematic. Also, but my previous job, I worked uh, for, I was a contractor working for a company that built semi-submersible oil rigs. So I understood the mechanical model and how things were done. So I had a knowledge of how things work mechanically. So I was able to understand that part. And and over there, of course, there's a learning process. You don't walk into a job and go, ha ha, I can do this. There is a bit of a learning curve. But, and they gave me the time to understand, hey, look at some of our old manuals, get acquainted with them come out with me, uh, I went out with one of the engineers who I interviewed with, and I got a hands-on, this is how this sort of works, and it really helped. So they helped me, but the, the real key there is know your industry, or at least have some knowledge. You can't go in and say, you, you can't go in cold, unless you really have previous experience there. I, I love how you're saying that because um, like in the in the previous industry, you learned how to read schematics and mechanical drawings and you leverage that from, you know, oil rigs and that uh, power equipment to this type of equipment. I love how you're saying 
you're continuously learning, you're not stopping. Even when you entered a new industry, you kept researching and moving on. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that um, for an upgrade um, project that you were working on, that you actually yeah. did, um, you actually had hands-on work and you actually worked in the physical machine and a oh. technician. Can you tell us more about that, how you translated that in-person interaction into the written word? Well, my unfortunately, my handwriting is atrocious. So really, when I take notes when I'm working on something, only I can read them. So if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, my boss is going to go, uh, I can't read this. Um, but what happens is usually we, we do a number of upgrade kits. A customer, customer will say to us, hey, I really wish your sorter had this functionality, or can it do this, or could you put a shoot heater on this, because we're in, a, we're in a cold climate. So what we do is we build kits that allow us, and because somebody else might want them, um, we show in our catalog that, oh, we have this available as well, just check the box and we can add that. But when you have to develop the original kit, I go out there, I the engine, our, one of our engineers will actually design the kit, pull in the tools that uh, are needed to actually create it, pull in the pieces that are needed to do this upgrade kit. And usually we have a technician I'll go out with and we will put the pieces on the machine and I will, you know, I'll say, hang on, I need to write this down. Okay, I will take pictures as well. Pictures are a thousand words, as you know. Um, so I'll take pictures at the same time, and I'll take good enough pictures to put into the upgrade procedure. And that way, and also since it's stored single source, I can use this for something else I need to. Right, right. I love that. I love that. Because um, I know a lot of times, um, <clears throat> I go, like in doing interviews and just getting with clients, they always ask, how comfortable are you working with SME subject matter experts and working with, um, especially if you're in the software industry, working with like your software developers and in your case, working with technicians. Um, I think I can, I, I got to understand um, how important it is to be able to work with your knowledge experts in whatever industry that you are in um, to leverage that technical writing, um, um, leverage that, that content, that deep expertise into your technical writing. It makes it more authentic. Um, there's something that you, go ahead. There's something that you keep uh, mentioning about using pictures and layouts. Um, even 36 years ago, is that something you wanted to do outside of technical writing, sort of design, instructional design, manual design, or did you just uh, fall into that as an extension of technical writing? I fell into it. It was just we, <clears throat> we did it a certain way. Um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, and I and even 36 years ago, I would say to my boss, can we do it this way? Uh, here's what I've done. What do you think of it? If it met with approval from uh, from engineers and field service, okay. And then they just pretty much stopped asking me uh, for, can we review it? It was just, okay, well, we know, Bill uh, knows what he's doing. So. And, but even now, um, what we do now, the Sataki manual, is far different than, say, the Sataki Scan Master manual of 1998. They're, they're, they look like they're from two different companies. What's important <clears throat> when you're writing a manual, a very technical guide, what's important there versus if you're writing something that will ultimately go on a website or an FAQ document. What are some of the differences you use to capture that information? Well, I capture the big picture and then I decide what goes where. Mm. Once, with, with single source and being able to turn things into snippets, I can take everything and then I could just pick and choose what I actually need. And the stuff that goes on an FAQ, I would maybe a snippet about an explanation as to how to turn on a shoe heater. Okay, we'll do this, press this button, or you know, because we have touch screen. So you, you go into this menu, touch this, and it turns on. The text itself is just as relevant no matter where it goes, but I only need that one little piece of it in an FAQ. Maybe I might have a picture that I took of that screen with an arrow pointing to where that selection is. 
something like that. I love that. Yeah, for a manual, you would need a lot more information, and but I would already have that information. And then, do you? You said sometimes your customers reach out to you to actually ask for specifics or certain modifications. How do you collect that information, and then how do you know that whatever that you developed is actually what they were looking for? Like, what's your check there? Well, usually we get it from the sales department, uh, sales and marketing. Uh, hear from the customer, and I know the people in sales. They say, "Hey, Bill, we need such and such." Okay, and we'll chat about it. And uh, since we know the machine, the machine is a machine. You only so many things you can put on. We have an idea. We'll meet with the engine, meet with engineers to decide. All right, what do we need to go on here? And then when they create the kit, and then off we go. Um, if it works, it, it really doesn't matter how it looks, it's just how it works. If it does what it needs to for the customer, that makes them happy. I love that, I love that. Um, and then working with the sales team and sales copy, marketing copy, compared to technical writing copy, what would you say are some of the similarities? You know, it's, it's a unified company and some of the differences between the different types of copy there. Well, I the marketers do their own marketing writing, and really what they're trying to do is sell a product. So they will show the key features, mm. and whereas I tend to show what the features do. Mm. So they'll do the high end from 30,000 feet stuff. Look at the capacity end. It's going to be 46 tons per hour with this. Um, but I won't mention that unless it's part of the specification part of the document. I will instead talk about how to operate the machine to make it sort 46 tons per hour. Or actually our new vantage sorter, the, the eight shoot or four shoot with 880 millimeters of, of shoot width will actually uh, sort 60 tons at certain product per hour. It's a lot, a lot of food product. That's a lot. That's a lot. I love that. I love that. Um. So, so just like we're coming down towards the end here. So, take us back through um thirty six years, the Navy, oil and gas, power, now into optical. Any highlights? Any insights? Any regrets? Any things you would have done differently? Any um words of wisdom? Thirty six years. That's a long time. Anything at all you want to share? Well. Firstly, yeah, it's been a long and varied career. I've experienced a lot of odd things. I've, technical writing is kind of a niche position. Uh, you probably will not become the vice president of your company if you're a technical writer. On the other hand, you will probably head a documentation department. I don't because um, the guy that who hired me is still there, and he's younger than I am. So, you know, I'll retire before he does. Uh, hi, Jeff, if you're there. Um, but it's, yeah, I wouldn't say that, but in going back to the, the actual process, prepare for the job. If, if you want this job, just don't go into it thinking that, well, I've got these qualifications, I can do this. Know where you're going. In other words, do your research. That's a huge thing. Um, look professional. That's always a, that's another big thing. Uh, and I see it when we have, like, for example, my company will interview people in the engineering department. I see the people who come in, they look professionally dressed. So that right off the bat is a, it's a plus, as opposed to coming in, you know, dirty and shaven and, uh, and whatnot. People think you're not really serious about working here. Yeah, yeah, understood, understood. I love it. I, I just want to go back to um something you, you keep repeating about how much research you did um transitioning into this industry and then how much research you still do. I, I am floored that even after so much decades of experience, you still took it upon yourself to work with a technician, get on the floor, like get dirty, so to speak, and really understand um the the equipment that you were writing about. Um, how critical is that as a technical writer to really understand what you're writing about? Or do you think 
you can i don't know fake it till you make it is that even a thing it depends on what you're writing about if you're writing for example if you're just writing copy you could probably come close to faking if you make it but really if you're writing technical documentation you have to know what you're writing about it takes time uh i didn't immediately go there in in, in hire on at sataki and start writing manuals i had to learn I, there was a learning curve to come up with and fortunately uh the people who interviewed me i actually was interviewed by three people live no zoom no anything was i sat in front of three people and I showed what little portfolio I had because unfortunately a lot of what I work with is uh, sorry it's uh it's proprietary yeah and so I can't just say hey look here is the latest manual that I did from Sataki look through it if I was going somewhere else I because that would get me in a lot of trouble I could be right we could uh, start probably lawsuits against me which I don't want um but the thing is that the uh, I was able to show them what I was capable of with what I had that was that was public. And yes, I did this, I did this. Um, and uh, but then I had to know what I was doing, and uh, and there was there was a, a ramping up time. So if you're coming into some place with a three month contract, I would definitely say know the industry first or have experience in that industry if you know you're looking for somebody who wants to write about hospitals and your area of expertise is uh, technical writing about automobiles know the industry first but probably they will see that we need somebody who can hit the ground running and probably you won't get that job but like i said the, the research is a huge help and since they were going 10 to to perm, and once again, I've been there 20 years, um, the research told me about the job. They interviewed three other guys, and well, three other people, I don't know. They just said guys, I have no idea if it was, it was, it was men or women. And I got the job. I love that. Um, this That's something critical that you just said, though, that because as a technical writer, a lot of your content that you generate is proprietary or behind an NDA. Um, how do you navigate that? Do you maintain a separate portfolio that you can share, like something you personally have written, like a website or something? And then during the interview process, how do you speak about prior work that you've ha you've done, you know, without giving out the bag, so to speak? Like, how do you manage that that delicate balance? Well, I, I do say that the work is proprietary. That's the, the first and foremost, and a lot of people understand that. And I can show other things that I have done in the past and, and, uh, for older product or something like that sometimes, uh, or something that's out, already out there in public domain that I did, I can do. Uh, website work, it's funny you mention website work because Sataki is in the process of updating their website. And so they asked me to create the plan, even though they know that I could create the content because I know the industry, but on the other hand, I'm not a web designer. We know that we have to go with somebody professional, but I'll also be on the committee to help them find the proper web designer. That's, that's, that's great, that's great. I love that, I love that. So <clears throat> in the last a minute and a half that we have left on the call, any last words for aspiring technical writers, tr AI, um, any trends that you're seeing, that you're loving, that you're hating, any last I, words for our community? I have not used AI. I'll, I'll be first to admit it. I have some coworkers, some friends who actually, but I was playing around with AI and I saw this. Uh, don't use that as a substitute for your own research. I say that, do your research. Uh, it's really not that hard. If you really want the job, you'll, you know, you'll show an interest in it and you'll first look at their website, then look at their industry. And that's one thing that I do now, even though I've been there 20 years, I still look at Sataki's competition. I see what they're doing. That was one of the things that got me to suggest um, making updates to the website. Hey, do you know what such and such is doing? Right. Do Little right. things like that. And uh, so we've had a bit of a push to do that. So I, I developed the 
ideas that we might need, things that could benefit us. And then I, this past week, I developed the phases of the plan that we do need to do that. But I have an MBA as well, so I was able to use my secret MBA powers and wear my MBA hat for a yes, while. Yes, secret. <laughs> do and, and, and create the, the plan and, and, uh, and figure out the milestones that you would need and go from there. So, so I, in, so in yeah. your MBA, you're leveraging your MBA into your technical writing. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is great. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us this week. Again, to everyone, apologies for the technical issues we had last week, but... <laughs> 30, this 36 years of technical writing has shown us that the more things change, the more they say the same. Should I, could I say that? And your ultimate winner is doing research. Really, I'm kind of replaced doing your own research to find a job, learn about a new industry that you want to get into. Um, and then the other thing that you really mentioned was getting to getting very familiar, intimate, one on one with the equipment, the people your technical experts that you're working with to make sure your, your technical writing is authentic and true. Um, I can't stress that enough. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. It has to be high quality. So thank you again, Bill, for joining us. I'm glad we were able to like figure out our technical issues here. Um, and for everyone else, we'll be back on next week for another technical writing stories. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. You too, Bye, all. Right.